topic to speak on new fonts in CSS. So, first of all, what I'll do is I'll do a couple of cases, uh, ask a few questions from the audience, and uh, it will be answered in a day, but if you want to tell. And, uh, and I'll come back to the answers of my talk. Right. So, I'll start off with a case. First case would be regarding a 13 year old girl presented with a spell of lightheadedness with loss of subconsciousness. Uh, at this moment, she was known to have transient, short lasting jerky movements, two to three jerks, noted by her classmates. She regained consciousness soon after, and this occurred while uh, she was doing a frog section in her biology class. Uh, she had no tongue biting, no urine incontinence, examination was normal. Her brother's diagnosis is juvenile myotonic epilepsy. So, the questions are Is, it, is this a seizure? If so, what type of seizure? Would you treat with anti seizure medication? And what are the relevant investigations? Uh, if someone wants to answer, yes, I can, uh, or we'll come back at the end. Right. So, so this is not, then I'll go to the second case. So, this is regarding 35 year old female presented after an episode of loss of consciousness. First, develop a sense of fear and a, a butterfly sensation in the stomach. Ten seconds later, she lost awareness. Observers reported that she looked around at the environment but did not respond to or follow commands. Uh, this was followed by stiffness of the right arm and leg. Episode lasts around 6 to 90 seconds. Following the event, she felt tired and not her usual self. So she denied smoking, no alcohol, no substance abuse, no history of fever, headache, photophobia, phonophobia, indicating a meningitic kind of illness or encephalitic illness, no limb weakness after regaining full consciousness. She does give a history of febrile seizures at the age of two years. Her EEG and the CT head were normal. So I asked again the same questions. Is this a seizure? If so, what type of seizure? Would you treat her? And what investigations? So to answer these questions, I'll uh, uh, go through uh, some basic slides. Um, explaining how we approach season, uh, approach to a new onset season. So the first question is, we have to always ask ourselves, is it actually a season? Then if it is a season, what is the type of season? And then if it's a season, is it epilepsy? And what kind of epilepsy? And what is the cause of this epilepsy? And how would you investigate? And should this epilepsy be treated? So first question is, is it season? So, as you know, there are a lot of seizure mimics. The commonest ones are syncope and psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. But there are many more seizure mimics. You know, TIAs can come as seizure mimics, migraine with aura, panic attacks, transient global amnesia, especially slightly in the elderly age group, uh, narcolepsy with cataplexy, and some paroxysmal movement disorders. So, I'll show a video first. This is actually done on a healthy adult German, the group of German um, healthy adults were asked to do a valsalva manual and induce an event which you can see. So, as you see, he's breathing deep, then he's asked to stand up and now observe what happens. So, he trans and loses consciousness. You can see there were jerks in this uh, gentleman who had a well cell by induced a syncopal attack. So the question is, uh, does jerks, if there are jerks, some people say, oh, this has to be epilepsy or see, uh, a seizure event. So remember, syncope can cause uh, jerks. And interestingly, there's a, uh, a study done on patients with syncope and uh, epilepsy. They uh, uh, put them through a, a, a tail table test and check how many jerks occur in patients with syncope and how many with seizures. So interestingly, if you have more than 20 jerks, it's a little bit more likely to be a seizure episode. And the tone is slightly increasing seizures. But if it turns out to be syncopal attack, they found out most of these patients, the jerks were less than 10, most around two or three. So the number of jerks, they generally if it's less it, by the witness, more, more likely could be a syncopal attack. The number of jerks is more than 20, more likely to be a seizure episode. So in this uh, slide, you can see a little um, 
small small dot indicates the number of jerks in a syncopal patients it will be small amounts but in a patient with epilepsy present with jerks jerks are a quite high number and most of them will be more than 20 so they say you could use the 10 20 rule in syncope versus seizure less than 10 jerks more likely to be syncope more than 20 more likely to be seizure so in addition to this as we know syncope has other features you know a preceding light headedness sweating prolonged standing precipitant like maturation and if it's cardiac in or in chest pain palpitation a slow heart rate and low blood pressure then the witness can see okay the patient goes pallor sweating again slow pulse and if they check the blood pressure blood pressure will be low so in two important things remember are the four p's of syncope posture onset and upright this is classically for vasovagal kind of syncope prodrome so you have a presidium blurring of vision nausea lightheaded the sweating and you have the provoking factors sight of blood pain or micturation this all can cause syncope and prompt recovery so if you remove these four p's you'd be more likely to um, diagnose syncope correct and you'll ask the correct questions uh, then the second most common um, seizure mimic is uh, when i say second most of one of the other, uh, other most common is psychogenic non-epileptic seizures so these epileptic Seizures are generally long lasting. They found out in a, a group of patients who come with status epilepticus, around 20% of the patients may be having non epileptic seizures than true epileptic seizures. Uh, then onset is gradual and termination also is gradual. So, a classical ep uh, epileptic seizure will be sudden or abrupt onset and it will have fluctuation course. Interesting, eye closed. So, if you see eye closed and it will be fluttering of eyes. They found out that even 92 percent of specificity, there's maybe not psychogenic non epileptic seizures and the side to side head movements, especially head or body. Uh, then pelvic thrusting, opistone posturing, and forced eye closure, and asynchronous jerks. As you see, there's an asterisk there because sometimes frontal lobe seizures can mimic psychogenic non epileptic seizures as well. That's important to understand. So I'll show a video I took from YouTube. I think one of my psychiatrists had uploaded it. Uh, you could see the lower limb movements, asynchronous, right, left, no synchrony. His eyes are it's not very clearly seen. The head movement side to side. So this is a, a video showing uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Uh, right, I'm not going into details regarding the other seizure mimics, uh, but seizure mimics can be a little different in children. Uh, like you can have jitteriness, uh, you'll have breath holding spells, cyclic vomiting, tics, stereotypy, or even hemiplegic migraine, uh, which can mimic seizures in children. I won't be talking in uh, detail regarding this uh, mimics, but just remember in children, it can be varied and different as well. So the question is, if it is seizure, what is the type? Because if you have a seizure, you need to describe so that everyone is on the same page when you describe the seizure. So the ILA into classification of seizure types. Uh, previously, as you know, we use the word simple, complex, unclassified. Things have now changed since 2017. Unfortunately, we still use old terms, which we need to change and become updated, maybe use the new terms. So a seizure onset is where I, at the onset it's witnessed or seen to describe the event. So, sorry. Uh, so important. So the seizure, if it's focal onset, you describe if the patient is aware or not aware. And based on that, if there's a motor component or non-motor component, and if it's generalized, again, is it motor, non-motor? And if onset is unclear or unknown, you can initially classify that unknown onset. And based on the phenomena you see, you say motor, non-motor, and later maybe if required, you can reclassify it into uh, with, uh, uh, further investigations. Right. So focal loans, as I said, will be divided based on the awareness, aware or impaired awareness, Motor onset based on whether there's automatisms, atonic seizures with it, 
clonic, epileptic spasm, hyperkinetic movements, myoclonic, clonic. So if any of these are there, we'll call it focal. Then the second step would be the impaired awareness or not, if there's motor component or is there a non-motor component. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the focal seizure can become a, like a generalized seizure. So um, we used to call it secondary generalized seizure. Now we call it focal to bilateral tonic clonic seizures. Understood? Right. And generalized onset seizure again, based on the uh, manifestation, will be motor or non-motor, as you can see in here. Unknown onset, again, even if we do not know, know the onset, we need to classify it in what we see the motor or non-motor. Right. So these are the old terms we used to use unconscious. Now it's replaced by impaired awareness. Partial, change to focal. Simple partial is called focal aware. Complex partial is called focal impaired awareness. Again, similarly, if you get this cognitive, uh, uh, we used to use the old word. Psychic is converted into cognitive. Secondly, generalized tonic clonic seizures are now important called focal to bilateral tonic clonic. And if there's any behavior, uh, arrest of arrest for pausing interruption, we now call it behavioral, behavioral arrest. Right. I'll quickly go through a quick summary of two patients. For example, this patient, how would you describe it? 25 year old woman coming with uh, 30 seconds of intense feeling of familiar music. She can hear people talking, but after realize that she could not determine what they were saying. So now after episode, she's mildly confused and has to reorient herself. So previously we would have called this complex partial seizure. Now we would call it focal seizure with impaired awareness. You see, there's a focality, there's an aura starting with it. She's able to interact with the environment, but she can interpret the environment. So she has impaired awareness. Similarly, another quick one, a woman comes to the room, finds her husband having a seizure on bed. She hasn't seen the onset. She's in bilateral stiffening followed by bilateral shaking, EG and MRI normal. So previously we said unclassified, but now we say unknown onset, uh, but for subsequently seen the tonic clonic movements, you say so unknown onset followed by the motor component is tonic clonic. Obviously, if you find an EG, MRI change later indicating a focal origin, you could reclassify to focal onset, tonic clonic later. So now if you say this is seizures, Next question is, is it epilepsy? So important to identify is sometimes patients come to you with first seizure, you have to address two issues first. Are they actually provoked or unprovoked seizures? Next is actually whether this is actually the first event at all, whether they have had minor events prior to this. So important, what is provoked seizure? We call it acute symptomatic seizure or provoked seizure. So these are the seizures that occur at the time of systemic insult or close relationship with a documented brain insult. For example, someone had hyponatremia, can have a seizure, Meta any other metabolic rearrangement, or coming with drug or alcohol withdrawal, or coming with a stroke with seizure, having a brain infection like encephalitis or head injury can come with seizures. So these are important because these are provoked seizures. So for example, if someone can have a stroke within one week, if you still have seizures, it still falls under the definition of acute symptomatic seizure. Again, if it can be an STH, infection, or metabolic rearrangement, as I said. So this occurs within a specific window. So important thing is, for these patients, this doesn't classify as epilepsy. This patient will be, and would they require long-term anti-seizure medication? Not indicated long-term, generally. Then, as I said, this first presentation may be not the first event they've had. For example, they might have had auras, which they would have neglected, that may be deja vu's, some odd sensation, which they would have thought normal. So if you ask them back, okay, yes, we have had auras. Or maybe patient generalized, present with a generalized uh, tonic clonic seizure, might have had myoclonic, early myoclonic jerks, indicating, okay, this patient actually had previous small seizure previously. So it's important to recheck and reevaluate. So if such seizures do exist, it is not a first seizure. So then they might be classified as epilepsy rather than a first seizure. And importantly, 30% of first seizure patients have had previous seizure, right? So then we come to the definition of epilepsy. So epilepsy, uh, you need uh, uh, 
to know there are three uh, definitions, or, I mean, three uh, points you need to know. At least two unprovoked seizures or reflex seizures occurring more than 25 hours apart. Sorry, this uh, is a little uh, uh, um, disarranged. So at least two unprovoked seizures occurring 24 hours apart. That's one. And then you can have one single seizure. And if the risk of getting uh, uh, risk of seizure at 10 years is more than 60% uh, in 10 years, then again classified seizure, or you can have an epilepsy syndrome. So what do you mean by unprovoked seizure? So it refers to seizure of unknown etiology. But in addition, you can have um, a seizure if you have a pre-existing brain lesion. Previously, um, you can still call it an unprovoked seizure. For example, if you have a um, brain lesion stroke 10 years ago or some brain lesion previously, and this also is referred as remote symptomatic seizure. So if you look at the risk of epilepsy, as I said, um, you need to have 60% uh, in 10 years, if it's a single unprovoked season. So if you see a uh, patient with uh, first season at five years, I put a line there at 60 months, uh, the risk of uh, uh, with the first season is less around 25, 30%. But if you have two or three seasons, the risk is more than 60%. That's why the definition comes, okay, and this five, 10 years, become, at 10 years, it maintains an almost similar uh, recurrence rate. So uh, in Accordingly, that's why the 60% uh, comes in. If you have a high risk of seizure with a single provoked, unprovoked seizure, you can classify as epilepsy. So if a patient does develop a first seizure, what is the risk of developing a second seizure? So actually the, the, high, the risk is high within the first one or two years, especially for, within the first one year. But after five years, three to five years later, the risk of developing a second seizure is less. So, which patient with first unprovoked seizure at high risk of developing a second seizure? The patient have a prior brain insult, like as, as I said, stroke, trauma, infection, as a history of cerebral palsy, or cognitive development, a disability. Or the EEG shows epileptiform discharges. Or there are a brain imaging suggesting, okay, this is a high risk for recurrent seizure. And if the seizure is nocturnal, again, it's a very important risk for recurrence of seizures. So as I said, if there are prior brain abnormality detected, we call it again, previously acute remote symptomatic seizure as well. So, so there's a study done looking at uh, seizure recurrence based on provoke versus unprovoked and remote symptomatic seizure. So that remote symptomatic seizure seems to have the highest recurrence rate of developing another seizure. Then there are factors which we thought may be related to recurrence, which are not. For example, patient's age, sex, family history of seizures, seizure type, and presenting state ep epilepticus. Sometimes two seizures within the 24-hour period. Uh, that's commonly as you have two seizures in 24-hour period, whether the risk is high. Again, the risk is they found out is similar to a single seizure within the 24-hour period. So two seizures or clustering within that single 24 period does not uh, uh, show increased risk later on, or it is similar to a single seizure presentation. Then after you say, okay, this is epilepsy, this is a seizure, you have to define what kind of epilepsy does it fall under. So we define initially focal onset, generalized onset, unknown onset. So then we concurrently, we need to look at etiology as well, but it defined as the epilepsy type, whether it's focal, generalized, or even could be combined generalized and focal or unknown etiology. And we need to define the epilepsy syndrome as well. Uh, and look at the comorbidities. This is like a holistically kind of thing when you diagnose epilepsy, look to the left, comorbidities, look to the right, etiology. So when you come to the etiology, uh, that could be many etiology. Some patients can have dual etiologies as well. So classically, a generalized epilepsy could be genetic. Sometimes there are, for example, tuberous sclerosis can have structural and genetic component both to cause epilepsy. Or there could be an infection, metabolic, or immune-mediated, as we know, a lot of immune-mediated epilepsies are coming up now. And of course, if you do not know the etiology of the investigations or history, it could have to classified as unknown at the start. 
So what do you do? Investigations rights to diagnose the onset seizures. Do you do brain imaging? Yes. If so, why do you do brain imaging? We do brain imaging to see if there's acute symptomatic seizures. If there's any reason for it. Or identify the risk of recurrence in remote symptomatic seizures. So they found out if you do a this is CT or MRI both, if you find an epileptic decretion on, the ima on imaging, the risk of seizure recurrence at one year is around 59%. So if there's an epileptic decretion, high, there's a risk is increased. So CT scan, is it useful? Yes, in the acute setting, especially, it's widely available. You can do it quickly. Individuals who cannot tolerate MRI, CT is a better option, and the cost is less. Uh, you need to do urgent CT scans, not in all patients, but there are a few indications which you need to do urgent CT scans. So all these urgent scans are done to look for acute symptomatic seizures. That means there's underlying infection, there's focal neurological signs, sudden onset headaches, such as well like subarachnoid hemorrhage, head injury, meningitic illnesses, features of raised pressure, pregnancy and postpartum, and history of malignancy, HIV, and chronic alcoholism. So in children, again, that's, I think, uh, uh, might come up in the next lecture, age uh, uh, less than 18 months with febrile seizures or age less than two years with non-febrile seizures may be indication to urgent CT scan. There's a more indication in children. So the question is whether it's CT or MRI or both, or what is better? So in this study, uh, they found uh, 478 patients, normal CT scan, they had MRIs only 12% detected epileptogenic lesions. So they found mesotemporal sclerosis and malformation of cortical development more detected in this group of patients who had a normal CT scan. So theoretically, resources available, MRI would be a uh, preferred neuroimaging modality. However, cost availability is a significant factor. As you see, it is superior in diagnosing some, for example, mesotemporal sclerosis, malformations, uh, uh, more detected MRI. However, question is regarding a tumor. Sometimes we are worried, are we missing a tumor if we do not do an MRI scan? So MRI detects um, uh, a tumor if the CT has missed it only in one out of 67 patients. So if you're just trying to do an MRI to detect tumor, you might have to period your 67 MRI scans, statistically speaking, to detect a missed tumor on a CT scan. Obviously it's again dependent on the reporting and um, the setting as well. So all in all, MRI not necessary, but increases the diagnostic yield. Then we come to the second and important investment, EEG. So uh, this EEG, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, this EEG useful in predicting the recurrence of seizures. So there are two types of uh, abnormalities that we've seen, epileptogenic, or focal slowing. Epileptogenic can be again generalized or focal. And this generalized epileptic from discharges shows highest risk of seizure recurrence. So if you look at uh, recurrence at two years, if you have a normal ECG, you can get about 27% of recurrent seizures. Non specific abnormalities, 37%. And if you have epileptic from activity, there's a 58% chance of getting seizure recurrence. So this timing matter, yes. So if you do an EEG within 24 hours, you can detect epileptic from abnormalities in 50% of the cases. But done a little later, as time passes, the, uh, uh, the detection rate drops. The next thing is, uh, if a standard EEG is done, do you repeat another standard EEG? Uh, from what I understand, if you do a standard EEG, if it's normal, when you do the repeat EEG, at least request for a sleep or a sleep deprived EEG as a second one because it does not add uh, significantly uh, to repeat to doing two standard EEG repeats. And if you suspect syncope, do not request an EEG because it might show four, uh, false uh, positive uh, signs of uh, false EEG changes. Then what about other investigations? So we do not need to do it routinely. It's all clinically indicated. If you think there's an acute symptomatic cause, yes. If you need to rule out a seizure mimic, yes. Uh, if you think it is a meningitic illness, yes. If you have a piece of drug toxicity, yes. So not necessarily routinely do routine, uh, other investigations, especially blood investigations, to detect uh, seizures. Uh, so the question is, do we treat first on seizures? 
So important thing to understand is if you treat a first seizure, immediate seizure recurrence uh, drops by 35% over the first two years. But long-term changes and prognosis may be not so high as we expect. Then I think we always forget this anti seizure medications are adverse, adverse effects. So, um, so adverse effects can come from 7 to 31 percent, so almost equal to preventing another seizure within uh, the first two years. The adverse event almost counters it. So, it, it has to be um, dependent on patient to patient. You need to make that call. So, short term gains are offset by side effects as well as important to remember. So, in addition, as I said, we might have to individualize based on risk versus benefit as well. For example, a 50 year old who's on warfarin for, on a, for a mechanical aortic well, first unprovoked seizure. You don't want him to have another seizure, have a fall and a catastrophic bleed. So in this case, we might have to consider, okay, the first unprovoked seizure, we might need to treat. Sorry. Yeah, so it is individualized. You need to assess the risk versus benefit to make that call. Right, so now I've come back with the previous two cases I have uh, shown you at the start and asked you the same questions again. So case one is 13 year old girl, lightheadedness, loss of consciousness, had jerks two to three, regained consciousness afterwards. This occurred when she was doing this property section in a biology class, no tongue biting, examination normal, brother diagnosed with junior myoclonic epilepsy. The question is, is this a seizure? Maybe I'll get uh, the audience to raise their hands uh, who thinks it's a season. Anyone thinks it's a season? Anyone? Yeah, if you think it's, there's no right or wrong answer, it's just all learning here. Anyone thinks it's a season? Anyone thinks it's not a season? Yeah, good. So we have uh, uh, quite a large number of uh, students and doctors who think this is not a season. Right, so good. Uh, if it's not a seizure, if it, is it a seizure mimic? What kind of seizure mimic are we thinking of here? Seeing copy good. So in this, we had the four Ps, the prodrome was there, lightheadedness, the position, the precipitant factor, and recovery soon afterwards. And obviously, the, sometimes people think there's jerkiness. This is you're shaking. This is seizure. This is not, that's something important you not need to understand. So obviously this is not season, this is a syncope. And do you treat this patient with anything? No. And do you need to investigate? So this has a clear cut history of a precipitate and a prodromal effect while cutting the frog. So this is a vasovagal syncope. You do not need to investigate in detail. So the history is important and the situation is important. The second question, 35 year old female, again, loss of consciousness, she had a sense of fear and then this butterfly sensation in her stomach. 10 seconds later, she lost awareness. Observers looking at her thought, uh, she looked at the environment but did not respond to commands. This was followed by uh, stiffness of the right arm and leg. This episode lasts 60 to 90 seconds. Following the event, she felt tired, not her usual self. No smoking, no alcohol, no photophobia, no phonophobia indicating meningitis illness, no limb weakness afterwards. History of fibrosis is at the age of two years, EG normal, CT head normal. Is this Caesar? Can I get a raise? Yeah, can you raise your hand? Okay. Good. So this people say this is Caesar. Good. If this is Caesar, what type of Caesar would it be? Focal or generalized or onset only? Most of focal seizure, onset focal. Those of uh, onset generalized, no one. Uh, those for unknown onset, so it's a focal onset. Focal onset seizure. So if it's a focal onset seizure, next thing is with it, with it, with it. next one is awareness impaired or not. Those of focal retained awareness, focal impaired awareness, etc. So good, oops, yeah. And then subsequently she had this right arm uh, stiffening of the right arm and leg. So that would indicate there's a motor component afterwards as well, right? So 
This patient uh, had focal lancet, implant awareness, motor component. In the motor component, she had in tonic type of motor on, uh, component. So this we would say as focal implant awareness, tonic season, right? Okay. The next question is, would you treat her? Would you treat her or not? There's maybe not. Those uh, are treating. Procedure is normal, uh, focal, impaired awareness seizure. Those are not treating. Those are needed. This is a tricky question, depending on the patient's background. Yes. Maybe the occupation or kind of, you know, there are a lot of other factors which we should consider for thinking about the treatment. Okay, so we, we uh, you know, just to drive the concepts uh, to you, we assume that it's uh, like 25 year old who is at, at home, uh, you know, housewife, uh, no other risk factors. No. First seizure, focal, uh, awareness, would you treat? You go back to some you know, charts showing the recurrence rates, you know, would you call it epilepsy or, you know, where do you think the patient is? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if, if I can classify, I think you know uh, the, the you, you may think that there is probably a mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, uh, but I think the syndromic classification is rather kind of like reserved for those who have very specific syndromes because here you know abdominal pain can be very really anything else. So. Uh, I totally agree. So we can, you know, apply the third factor. If, if you remember, Sami showed three, you know, criteria on which you can make the diagnosis. Uh, and as I said, yes, if there is a specific syndrome, there is one seizure, but direct syndrome, it could, you know, make a case. Uh, in this case, it's a bit, you know, we cannot be 100% certain this is a medial temporal lobe epilepsy, you know, for seizure, uh, but. Yes, that's a, a consideration. MRI was normal, right? So the important thing is to go back to the fundamentals. Is this epilepsy? If it's epilepsy, how do I make the diagnosis? Apply those three criteria and decide whether the patient fits into any one of those. Yes. So as Madam said, uh, the first unprovoked season, no EG changes, no imaging changes, no nocturnal events. So the high risk groups are negative. I mean, or doesn't take the high risk groups for recurrent seizures in an unprovoked seizure. Um, so, as uh, Madam said, uh, we don't, and uh, we, uh, as that's our uh, suggestion with this epilepsy syndrome. So, those are two things important to consider when you make that call. So, if it fits into a classical epilepsy syndrome, then you can say this is epilepsy and then treat. If it does not, you could say, okay, we'll uh, no, maybe not treat. Okay, I think that's all. Uh, I have. Uh, thank you very much. When evaluating adult onset for seizure, what is the place of non contrast CT versus the contrast in the CT of the brain? Ishar, you can have the FMI here. The question is clear, no? Like when we are the first seizure, what's the place for non contrast CT versus brain versus the contrast? Can I ask a Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, actually, there are studies to actually uh, compare that. Uh, there are studies which have shown that uh, the contrast and non contrast CT is used in acute setting to delineate acute symptomatic seizure. <clears throat> Uh, so there have been uh, studies to evaluate uh, whether giving contrast adds more information. Uh, and uh, the conclusion of most, uh, there are not much high quality studies, but uh, not many high quality studies, but uh, there, is, uh, there is not much of a difference. Uh, so uh, if, if, if we would recommend uh, something, and non-contrast, it would be added. 
Yes. So the difference is minimal. Yeah, thank you, Shah. So I should thank uh, Dr. Samir Wailing for that excellent presentation.